What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of The Daily Dose. I am glad y'all are here. I'm glad I'm here. And I'm glad that the Lord is here with us as we read the Bible and look at Matthew. So today is day number 241 in our daily Bible reading program. If you are new here, I'm Adam. Welcome. We have got a Bible reading plan that we are following that walks us through the Bible in its entirety over the course of a year. We are on the 241st day of said Bible reading plan. If you would like to see what that plan is all about, there's a link down in the description. Go click that link. It'll automatically download the uh, PDF guide to whatever device it is that you are using right now. So, as I was saying, we're in Matthew 11 and 12 today. We also have Psalm number 86 slipping in. Let's see what we got. So here at the beginning, we're opening up with a section about Jesus and John the Baptist. And here's something interesting. It says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He is a demon. Jesus, the Son of Man, came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. So, essentially, John wore, you know, we read he, that he wore these rugged, rough clothes, right? He had clothing that was um, kind of like sackcloth, you know, made of camel's hair, probably relatively unfashionable, um, maybe a little bit stinky. You know, I, I don't know. He lived out in the desert, out in the woods, out in the forest, in the country, you know, whatever you want to call it. He lived out in the sticks. We read that he ate locusts and honey, among other things. So this dude was basically eating like just the bare bones, basic, whatever he could gather from the earth, it seemed. And um, same thing for his clothes. He was wearing clothes that were not anything fancy. It was just whatever he could get his hands on. And, And Jesus is saying, look, John the Baptist was a holy man, right? He was a man of God. Um, but because he was not eating a bunch of fancy stuff and drinking a bunch of fancy stuff, he was just eating, you know, bugs and honey and living off the land. Y'all said he must have a demon in him. He must be demon possessed. But then Jesus contrasts that with himself. He says, but me, the son of man, I came eating and drinking, right? So I'm going around drinking with people, eating with people, fellowshipping, hanging out with sinners. And you guys want to talk about me being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners. So it's like Jesus is saying, hey, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. You're hypocrites. It's one or the other. I can't win. People that are righteous can't win, right? If somebody is not indulging themselves and fellowshipping with sinners, um, then you're going to talk bad about them this way. But if somebody is, you're going to talk bad about them that way, right? Jesus is like, with you guys, we can't win. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. What do you think that means? Look it up. I want y'all to look that up, Google it, and read some commentaries on that and see what the scholars think about that and see what God puts in your heart about that. Um, From there, we read a woe on unrepentant towns. Okay, So, you know, Jesus is going around proclaiming the message, the kingdom is at hand, and some areas and towns and people groups are openly accepting that. And others are eh, not so much. So Jesus gives a kind of a harsh word towards the towns that are not accepting what he says. It says this, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Uh, Notice that. They did not repent. Why doesn't it say they did not believe? Right? He could have said he denounced the towns because they did not believe. But that's not what he says. He says because they did not repent. And friends, could it be that believing and repenting are two sides of the same coin? Right? If there is true repentance, there will be true belief, and vice versa. If someone truly believes, there should be some form of true repentance. I believe that it's two sides of the same coin, and you can't have one side truly and legitimately without the other side, right? Then we read about the Father being revealed in the Son, okay? So Jesus says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That's an interesting claim right there. Right? That's an interesting claim. Um, And in my eyes, this kind of talks about 
in a sense, it talks about election, right? I know in the Methodist world, we don't talk a whole lot about election. Um, but I believe that election is legitimate. It's biblical. And, and here, notice, it says, No one knows the Father except for the Son, Jesus, and those who the Son chooses to reveal him. Right? So here it says, if I'm reading this correctly, it says that nobody knows God the Father unless Jesus chooses to reveal God the Father to you. Right? So it's not so much if you choose to believe. Okay? It's if Jesus chooses to reveal him to you. That's what comes first. First, Jesus has to reveal him to you before you have an opportunity, a real true opportunity to believe. So then I would also venture to say that this could be looked at as a claim of deity, right? Um, Jesus is saying, all things have been committed to me by my Father. So here he's, he's basically, sonship was often used as a form of, um, in regards to inheritance or ownership, you know, like if somebody was the son of a king, that son would be the heir of the throne. The son would have the right to the things of the throne, right? So when Jesus is claiming this sonship of God the Father, um, sometimes that was viewed as making oneself equal with the Father. Anyways, we'll save that for another time. So um, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Here's what Jesus says to the scribes and the Pharisees. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Notice that, the Son of Man, Jesus referring to himself, he is saying, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, again, the Pharisees would have said, blasphemy. What blasphemy is this? <clears throat> um, how can anyone but God say, I am in charge of the Sabbath? I am Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath submits to me, right? It's basically what he's saying here. How can anyone other than God say, hey, I'm in charge of the Sabbath. I'm superior to the Sabbath, right? Claim of deity. Bam. Mic drop. Then we read about how, uh, we read about God's chosen servant, Jesus, and that's a reference to Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. We read about Jesus and Beelzebul, sometimes called Beelzebub. There's a few variations on the name, generally referring to the enemy, um, Satan or demonic forces. <clears throat> so this section is kind of interesting. Um, it says, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. So here we have someone who was blind, couldn't see, mute. Generally, that means unable to talk for whatever reason. And three, this person was demon-possessed, okay? Was this person born blind and mute, and then later on they were demon-possessed? I, I don't know. Was this person a fully functioning human that could see and talk, and then at some point this person became demon-possessed, and that's when they lost their sight and the ability to talk? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Either way, here's what happens. Um, Jesus heals him, casts out the demon, the guy can see, and the guy can speak, right? But notice, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So here Jesus is healing people, doing good, casting out demons, and the Pharisees are like, the only way he can cast out demons is because he's the, the prince of demons, right? That's the only reason he's doing this. This comes from the enemy. This doesn't come from God. Right, ascribing the works of Jesus to the devil of all things uh, is what's going on there. Next, we have a section that talks about the sign of Jonah. Okay, and this is a cool little reference to the Old Testament, the book of Jonah. Y'all know the story, right? Jonah was supposed to go prophesy some some um, some words of repentance to this people group, and the people group were going to repent, and God was going to forgive them. And Jonah did not think that these people were worthy of hearing the message that God wanted him to preach. So Jonah psh, runs off. Ultimately, he ends up stranded at sea, gets swallowed by a whale, and he is in the belly of a whale 
for three days. Count them. One, two, three. Bam. After three days, he gets puked up, lands on the beach, <coughs> and um, decides he's going to go through with God's plan and go preach the message God wanted him to preach. But Jesus references that, right? Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, mind you, Jesus has been doing all kinds of signs, and we know the Pharisees have been seeing them because the Pharisees have been talking smack and rebuking Jesus, like the story we just heard about the sign he gave by casting out the demon, right? Was that not a sign? Jesus healed this man who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. He totally heals that dude, casts out the demon, and what better sign than that? Yet the Pharisees said, oh, that was of the devil. So now they're asking for a sign, right after rejecting a sign that he already gave. So Jesus answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. What is the sign of Jonah the prophet? Well, I'm glad you asked, because Jesus tells us. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here we have a prediction of Jesus about his own death, that he's going to die, that he's going to be put in that tomb in the heart of the earth for three days, and then he will be raised back up to life, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, might as well have been dead, and then he was brought back to life, so to speak. Then the last section that we read about in today's scripture is about Jesus' mother and brothers. Okay, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside waiting to speak to him. Someone told him, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to speak to you. Yo, go out there and talk to them. They're, they're waiting for you, right? So here's what Jesus says. Does he say, oh, my mom and my brothers, hey, come here, homies, come here. Let me give you a hug. What's going on? No, that's not what he says. Jesus says, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? So Jesus is like, look, you want to bring up family? You want to bring up relationship? You want to bring up relatives? Well, look at this. Think about it. Who really are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Okay, so he's taking it to a deeper spiritual level here. He's like, yes, those are my brothers and my mother and my sisters and so on and so forth um, in a worldly manner, but in a spiritual manner, who are my mother? Who's my brothers? Who are my sisters? Right? And then he says, pointing to his disciples, these are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is a brother and a sister and a mother to me. <clears throat> so here Jesus is kind of flipping the concept of family upside down. Right? Family was a huge thing. It still is today. But family was a really huge thing back in those times in, in that culture. Right? Family was like, that was the main thing, your family. Taking care of your family, providing for your family. Um, family was huge, okay? So here Jesus is saying, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? All of you who believe and do the will of my Father are. Notice, he doesn't say, whoever simply believes, whoever claims to believe, whoever um Whoever ties when the basket comes by is my brother or my sister or my mother. He says, whoever does, does the will of my Father in heaven. And again, there are so many places in the Bible where it talks about all you have to do is believe. Just believe. But there's just as many other places where it says you have to do. You have to act. You have to obey. Right? So in order to reconcile... Um, these various places in the Bible where it seems that there are potentially contradictory things being said, you have to bring them together and figure out, well, how can both of these things work together? How can both of these things be true, even though they seem like they might be saying different things, right? There's a number of places in the Bible that in a one specific passage, it will talk directly about believing and obeying, believing and repenting. Right? It will talk about belief and action together in multiple places. There's other places where Jesus will just highlight the belief part. There's other places in the Bible where the doing or the obedience part is highlighted. But again, I believe there are two parts to the same coin. Okay, You've got a coin, heads and tails. You've got a coin, you've got faith and or belief. You've got repentance 
and or obedience, right? Two sides to the same coin. So that's all I've got for y'all for today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Thanks for letting me ramble on a little bit long. I hope y'all are enjoying this trip through the Bible and the New Testament as much as I am, and we'll do it again tomorrow, God willing. Till we meet again, deuces.